Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome back to the Beer Institute and the fourth installment of our, our web series, You Ought to Know, a Beer Industry Employee. I'm Jim McGreevy, President and CEO of the Beer Institute, and we are one of uh, Washington, D.C.'s oldest trade associations representing the beer industry, brewers, suppliers, uh, and uh, others uh, since 1865, representing beer and all things beer. We're pleased to have you back for another uh, in our continuing conversations with folks in the beer industry. 2.1 million Americans owe their livelihoods in one way or another to the production, distribution, and sale of beer. We are a $328 billion industry um, uh, providing uh, great products and great times to Americans throughout, throughout America. Um, and one of those 2.1 million Americans is here with me today to discuss what he does in the beer industry. I'm happy to welcome Adam Warrington, the Vice President of Better World at Anheuser-Busch. Welcome, Adam. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate being here. You betcha. We appreciate having you. Um, Adam, you've been at uh, Anheuser-Busch for a good few years now um, and Vice President of Better World for a number of years. Uh, could you give us a little sense of your background and what you're focused on in your job as VP of the Better World at Anheuser-Busch? Absolutely, be happy to. And, and Jim, as you mentioned, I am incredibly proud to be one of the 2.1 million Americans uh, employed by the beer industry. Um, I've been with Anheuser Busch for seven years now. As you mentioned, I'm our vice president of Better World. Better World is our platform for social impact, or what some would call corporate social responsibility. So I've been in this role about two and a half years now, overseeing uh, the three pillars of our Better World platform, which are uh, environmental sustainability, responsible drinking tied to the consumption of our products, of course, uh, and community affairs and what we can do for all the communities in which our products are served. Prior to that, I had a, a series of communications roles in the company. I led corporate communications for AB when I joined and then moved over uh, to oversee communications for our craft and import brands for at the time was the business unit we called the high end. Corporate social responsibility is certainly something that's been very important to uh, many uh, businesses, uh, corporations, whether they be national or global in scope, um, and you guys at AB have really taken it to the next level. So you mentioned the three pillars uh, of your better world, the first being community engagement, community affairs. One of the, one of the keystones of that, uh, of that pillar uh, of better world is the emergency drinking water uh, program. Uh, we see it all the time when natural disasters happen. Uh, you guys are, are right there. Um, uh, with uh, the needed supplies for folks who are impacted by uh, whatever happens in, in the United States. Could you just give us a little sense of how that program started and um, what it does? Be happy to. Uh, so incredibly proud to, to be a part of our emergency drinking water program, as are many of my colleagues. Uh, our program started in 1988 in partnership with the American Red Cross uh, with a very simple goal um, when natural disasters hit whether it be an earthquake, hurricane, flooding, uh, or other natural disasters, uh, and access to clean, safe drinking water is either limited or removed, the Red Cross reaches out to us uh, and along with our wholesaler network, deliver water to those in need and to the areas in need. Uh, so it's been 32 years now we've had the program going. 32 years, and, and uh, sadly, every year, you, uh, you have to keep the program going. How, how much... Uh, how much emergency drinking water do you wind up um, uh, distributing in the course of a year? Varies from year to year, Jim. Of course, uh, you know, some years, unfortunately, are, are heavier in terms of natural disasters and, and lack of access to clean, safe drinking water. Uh, between 1.5 and 3 million cans has been an, an average year, so to speak, for us. We're typically in that range. Uh, this year, due to a number of factors, we will, we will exceed 3 million cans donated. So you have to make the water, uh, you have to distribute the water. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, that, uh, the sort of the specifics of that production and that distribution. Yeah, absolutely. So we have two breweries that are set up to, uh, to can our emergency drinking water. It started in our Cartersville, Georgia brewery uh, in 1988. And then in 2018, we added our Fort Collins, Colorado brewery. Uh, so we work with the GMs, we work with our, our production team at both those breweries to set up water runs where we stop producing beer for a period of time in those breweries uh, so we can can drinking water, have it ready to go in stage when the Red Cross calls us and water needs to be delivered through our wholesaler network. So you've, you've got the water already staged both in Cartersville and, and out in the West. 
Um, uh, distributors are very important to the uh, suppliers in beer uh, on any given day. The, the partnership between the distributor and the brewer is super important. How do you work with your distributors uh, to deliver the water when need be? Yeah, I mean, much like our, our core business, our emergency drinking water program is not possible without our wholesaler partners and our wholesaler network. Um, like I said, when the call comes from the Red Cross, uh, we determine which brewery makes the most sense uh, for the water to be sent out from. Really, our Cartersville, Georgia brewery handles the Eastern United States, and our Fort Collins, Colorado brewery handles the Western United States typically. That's the way we like to set it up. So our logistics team gets to work. It's the water out of the brewery right away uh, into our wholesaler partner and to their territory. And from there, of course, using their expertise, their relationships uh, and their fleet, they get the water to exactly where the Red Cross needs it to go uh, within their territory. Actually, why don't you give us, a, if I could just step back for a second, uh, you know, obviously the, the distributors are a force multiplier for you all in, in, the, uh, in the brewing and supplying end, uh, both for, in the beer business day to day and in, and in your work with the emergency drinking water program. How many folks are in your um, uh, department and what kinds of jobs do they do, Adam? Yeah, so we have a 10 person team here on our Better World team at Anheuser Bush. And our team is essentially assigned to one of our three pillars. People who are focused on our responsible drinking programming activations, of course, heavy work with our wholesalers to execute those plans. Uh, we have a team who works uh, in conjunction with other colleagues at AB on our environmental sustainability programming, communications, execution, tracking our progress against our sustainability goals, which uh, I know we'll talk about in a few minutes, Jim, uh, as well as a team dedicated to community affairs, um, overseeing our Anheuser-Busch Foundation, overseeing our emergency drinking water program, uh, overseeing all of our, our nonprofit partner relationships. Uh, we're also lucky enough to have a research and policy team that sits with our Better World team as well. Golly, 10 people doing all that. That's very good. Um, and are they based around the country or are they uh, all situated in New York or St. Louis? We're split fairly evenly between our offices uh, in New York and St. Louis. Good. Um, uh, so you're obviously reacting to uh, events that happen, natural disaster, the natural disasters that happen to get the water to the people who need it. I mean, you also have a whole proactive uh, emergency drinking water program. Uh, let's talk about that for a little, a uh, little bit, Adam. Yeah, very, very happy to and, and proud to. So in 2018, we brought our Fort Collins brewery online to can water. Um, in many ways, we doubled our ability to can water our capacity. So a challenge uh, from the top, a challenge from our CEO, Michelle DeCaris, was what more can you do with this program? It's an amazing program. You know, we're doing a lot of good. We're responding reactively uh, to the Red Cross, but could we do more? Uh, and the insight was, what can we do for our firefighters across the country, specifically volunteer firefighters? So through a series of discussions, we learned, um, first of all, the extreme hydration needs that firefighters have. Um, Firefighters need more water than professional athletes, which isn't a surprise when you factor in, of course, the gear they're wearing and the extreme heat when they're fighting fires themselves. Uh, many of our volunteer fire departments have very finite budgets. So sometimes water is a line item they, they may or may not be able to afford to have on hand during a year. Uh, our water comes in aluminum cans, it's very portable. Um, and we partnered with the National Volunteer Fire Council, NVFC, uh, who helped guide us and, and they validated the need of water with firefighters across the country. They let us know where the water needs to go. So fire departments can make requests to the NVFC. So much like with the, the reactive element of our water program with the Red Cross, the NVFC guides the proactive element. So we have that third party validation, that third party expertise who lets us know exactly where the water needs to go, how much um, and when it needs to get there. That partnership with Red Cross or the uh, firefighters organization uh, must be super important in being able to have a successful program year in and year out, I imagine. It is. We, we need their expertise and, you know, um, their board is made up of, of um, you know, fire chiefs across the country who understand what's going on and needs, of course, out west, uh, the Pacific Northwest, Colorado, uh, are very different than the needs of firefighters in the Northeast, uh, you know, where I am today. So, helping us understand those needs, validating the need, how quickly water needs to go out. Of course, many of these men and women are, are, are risking their lives, donating their time to fight wildfires that are going on across the country. Wildfires, unfortunately, going on in Colorado right now. We work with the MVFC to get water where it needs to go um, to hopefully help these men and women uh, while they're so bravely uh, helping their communities. So I'd like to move on to your um, hand sanitizer program, but before I do, 
it, it feels like the community, uh, sorry, the emergency water program has, has been sort of a model for how you did the hand sanitizer program over the course of the last few last few months. Um, if you would just tell us uh, how 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 much water, as a sort of a final question here, how much water um, uh, the program, both from a reactive and a and a um, proactive distribution has been distributed over the 30 or so years of the program? Yeah, at this point, we are, uh, we've donated more than 85 million cans of, of emergency drinking water and counting. Wow, wow, 85 million cans. This is obviously an important um, uh, piece of work that you're doing in Better World every year. Um, but um, uh, I think you've also told people about this um, uh, through a Super Bowl ad a couple of years ago. Let's watch. Stand by me. I'm just curious, Adam, uh, what was the reaction to that uh, ad uh, a couple years ago when you ran it? Well, I'll tell you, Jim, it still gets me, number one. I've seen it uh, many, many times. It's a wonderful piece of creative. Uh, the reaction from our colleagues, uh, our wholesalers was, was off the charts, and consumers, of course, you know, going through our flagship Budweiser brand. I can't emphasize enough the, the amount of pride our colleagues feel who are canning water, moving water from our breweries to where it needs to go to our wholesalers, the wholesalers who are helping to distribute it in their communities. Uh, it's a tremendous source of pride. It ties into our culture uh, of bringing people together uh, to serve our communities. You know, to me, it's perhaps the ultimate representation of how we can give back. So that ad really acts as a thank you to the, the employees who are involved in it. It acts as a way of telling people what you're doing and it acts as a, as a way of you know, sort of showing uh, what people may not see about the company. Really, it's a, it's very, it's very well done. Obviously, yes. That's our, that's our general manager at Cartersville, Kevin Farrenkrog, who's who's featured in that spot. That's those are real people. Those are the men and women who, who give their time to make this program what it is. Yes, indeed. And the men and women uh, of your company have also given a lot of time to make hand sanitizer over the last few months. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, how that uh, came to be? Um, and uh, the parallels with the emergency drinking water program. Well, of course, it's been a very interesting year for all of us, of course, not to you know, give a, a cliche, but uh, Jim, if we would have talked a year ago and you would ask me questions about hand sanitizer, I probably wouldn't have had a lot of feedback for you. Um, but certainly a lot of knowledge or expertise have gained quite a bit. You know, of course, when, when the health crisis started in earnest in March, the first question we ask um, at AB is what can we do? Uh, and what can we do that makes sense? So our water program ties into our core capabilities in a wonderful way, in terms of production, in terms of logistics, distribution. These are things that we know how to do and we feel that we do them very well. So it tapped into that, it wasn't foreign to us. Um, hand sanitizer uh, is the vast majority of hand sanitizer, of course, it's ethanol. So we have ethanol when we make our, our non-alcoholic products like Bud Zero, Odules, uh, products like that. So we knew that we, we learned very quickly how to produce it, produce it safely based on FDA guidelines. Uh, we knew we had the model in place to distribute the product, uh, leaning on both uh, nonprofit partners like the American Red Cross, leading on our government affairs teams into various state agencies who had needs. And of course, we had our, our, our wholesaler network. We had distribution in place. So um, producing uh, was something we learned very, very quickly to do it safely and efficiently. We used two breweries to produce our hand sanitizer. Uh, one in Baldwinsville, New York, and then our, our brewery in Los Angeles, California. Um, once we procured the needed 
plastic bottles, labels, things like that, which frankly were a little bit of a challenge early on in the health crisis, we were able to get this program up and running and, and did model it after our emergency drinking water program, as you mentioned. So you had um, you had the the, uh, the base of the product from the brewing process. Um, you had the, uh, the 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 skills and the knowledge of understanding the logistics program. You found two other breweries, or you, you called upon two other breweries in your system uh, to make the hand sanitizer. Um, how much has been distributed up to this point, seven or eight months into the pandemic? Yes. Yeah, so our, our first run of hand sanitizer, those donations occurred this spring in April and May. We distributed 500,000 eight ounce bottles of hand sanitizer uh, across a number of states, uh, 38 states, if, if my memory serves correctly. Uh, that was guided by the, Amer the American Red Cross uh, when they held blood drives to make sure the men and women who were giving blood, working the blood drives, had hand sanitizer to stay safe. Uh, numerous state agencies that identified distinct needs for hand sanitizer this spring. Um, so that was our, our first run. Uh, and then recently we produced another 8 million gallons of hand sanitizer that we have donated to uh, various secretaries of state, uh, election officials across a number of states uh, for the men and women who are working the polls this election day and the men and women who come to vote uh, to help through the democratic process. So it sounds again, sort of very similar to the drinking water program, sort of a reactive, a reactive uh, a moment where you um, saw the need, saw your ability to fill the need and went out and did it and then uh, more of a proactive uh, uh, need as we got closer and closer to election day. Again, partners must be very important in this process. Partners are critical. You know, we can't do this alone. We recognize this uh, much like with our water program. We felt this hand sanitizer program tied into our core capabilities, tied into the ability to produce a product that was needed very quickly, distributed very quickly, but we need to be guided to where it should go to do the most benefit, right? And that's the expertise, of course, we don't have. So working with nonprofit partners, state and federal agencies to help guide us, where can it do and give the greatest impact was critical, much like our water program. And without those partnerships, uh, this program would not be uh, what we feel it has been so far this year. So the first pillar, the first pillar, community engagement. Um, second pillar, second pillar has been around a long time in beer and at Anheuser-Busch, uh, uh, beer and Anheuser-Busch's commitment to responsible consumption. Uh, tell us about how Better World um, um, talks about responsible consumption of beer. Yes, yeah, so our, our company's history with responsible drinking, responsible consumption and, and marketing our products responsibly goes back more than 100 years. Uh, so Budweiser uh, over 100 years ago had some ads tied to Budweiser means moderation, uh, encouraging consumers to drink moderately. Um, so we're very proud of that. Um, really in earnest, uh, our, our commitment goes back to 1982 uh, with um, launching a program called Know When to Say When. So we have promoted social norms of, of course, destination and driver, um, hydrating between beers, planning ahead for a safe ride home. Um, it's critical to us that all of our products are enjoyed responsibly. We want every experience of our products to be a positive one. Uh, so to do so, our employees, our brands, our wholesalers, all of our key stakeholders, uh, we need to help educate and help us um, spread the word, if you will, um, on how our products we feel should be enjoyed. And we have we in brewing and you and Anheuser Busch have a, have a unique role in in uh, promoting responsible consumption. Uh, we have seen uh, fatalities, uh, road fata road fatalities because of um, uh, alcohol uh, be cut in half since 1982. So you know, talk about the role that you see the um, uh, beverage alcohol suppliers having. And uh, you know, we're we're not taking credit. We're not. Uh, we're not doing everything here. Others are partnering with us, but we have a central role, really, don't we? Uh, we have a critical role. I think you said it very well, Jim. You know, thank you. And of course, I think you know, you and I and all of our colleagues in industry, we can't be satisfied until we get that number to zero. Of course, of of anyone uh, you know, injured seriously uh, in a drunk driving related accident, uh, it's our responsibility to ensure marketing, to ensure activations at the store, at the on-premise level. Uh, are there resources like ride sharing partners, um, education in terms of alternating between beers with water to hydrate yourself, ensuring food is served at occasions. That is all critical to getting the message out in terms of how our products should be enjoyed. Uh, beer is the beverage of moderation, certainly when you compare it to other alcohol products. So we want to ensure our products are, again, always enjoyed responsibly. How do we do so? How do we connect to consumers? That's the challenge that 
that the team I get to be a part of now, Better World at Anheuser Busch, you know, working with our brand teams. Um, of course, we lead the lead the way with our Budweiser brand. How can we engage consumers while also educating them? The, the beverage moderate um, beverage moderation. I, I, you can't really say it more succinctly or better than that, Adam. Right? We we are uh, by and large lower ABV than other um, uh, sectors of alcohol. Uh, we're in a container, whether it be an aluminum bottle or an aluminum can or a glass. Um, uh, we are. We are different than uh, spirits and wine in, in many different ways. Um, you guys are uh, logistics geniuses, uh, obviously, in so many different ways. You're also um, uh, creative geniuses as well. And you've put your backs behind uh, advertising around responsible consumption and urging people in a very public way uh, to, um, to drink responsibly. Um, we have an ad that we'd like to show you. So why don't we run that ad? Come home, buddy. You and me, we were made for love. A lifetime is not long enough to show you what you mean to me. Ooh, I'll be waiting here for you when you come home to me. I'll see you later, buddy. I shouldn't drive home last night. I stayed at Dave's. When you come home, I'm back. I'm back. To me. Yeah, I'm back. Two questions that sort of spring to mind just uh, seeing that commercial. That's from the 2014 Super Bowl. Um, I know you're not uh, you're not in marketing, but um, uh, how do you guys? 2014 Super Bowl for this ad. 2018 for the other ad. How do you all look at the Super Bowl? Uh, it, it must be an opportunity with so many eyeballs to to really send a, a variety of messages to the consumer. Yeah, well, for that spot, friends are waiting, Jim. I was actually lucky enough to be part of the creative team, uh, one of many who worked on that. So occasionally they they let me in the circle to help. Um, friends are waiting actually was not aired in the Super Bowl. It was aired outside. Um, just to clarify, we've had other spots tied to responsible drinking. We have aired in the Super Bowl. Uh, that spot uh, received more than 20 million organic views on YouTube. It really resonated very deeply with people. Very proud of that. Um, you know, in terms of the Super Bowl and investing above the line, um, it ties back to our position and our corporate reputation to ensure uh, all of our stakeholders, of course, including consumers, understand what we stand for in terms of helping our, com our communities, excuse me, tied to our water program ensuring our products are enjoyed responsibly and understanding how we're we're trying to operate our breweries efficiently and sustainably as well as our products are, are shared that same way um, and one other point just tied to responsible drinking if you don't mind since 1982 we along with all of our wholesale partners have invested well over one billion dollars towards commercials like that media buys on the ground activations we audit that number rigorously each year we're we're getting near 40 years since we started auditing it um, and we're, we're closing in, frankly, um, uh, on another milestone number there, too. But we passed the one billion mark uh, about six years ago. So uh, very proud. And, and we aim to put our money with our wholesalers where our mouth is in terms of sharing the message. And really, that 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 message towards responsible consumption only gets stronger as the infrastructure changes, really. Safe rides, the, the advent of Uber and Lyft and other ride sharing programs, uh, the advent of no alcohol beer, which I want to talk about a little bit with you. What, but uh, related to responsible consumption, any any further guidance for our viewers on uh, on um, how to think about responsible consumption, what they should be doing before they walk into a bar, when they're in a bar, and when they leave it? Yeah, at, at Hazard Bush, we are a huge proponent of social norms, right? So we really shouldn't tell you what to do, but we should encourage you uh, normative behavior uh, to weave into your life. So through a Budweiser brand, our Better World team created a platform that we call Drink Wiser which has two pillars. One is hydrate between buds, very simple action. And the other is plan ahead for a safe ride home. So well, if you're going uh, when it's safe to do so, of course, to a bar, to a restaurant, to a concert, to a sporting event, uh, planning ahead so you can enjoy your time there, enjoy the beers you may want to consume, 
have that safe ride home is, is, is critical. So it's about planning ahead. It's ensuring those norms are kind of ingrained in what we do and then continually reminding consumers uh, of those norms. One way that uh, one way that you as brewers uh, have a big role in responsible consumption is the making and the production of beer. Um, you, re you recently launched uh, Budweiser Zero. Um, why don't you talk about how your company views um, beer without alcohol and where that might be going in the United States? Yes, um, we're very proud of our, our history in the nine alk segment. We are the leader in the nine alk segment, as we are, in, of course, in some other segments as well. We're proud of that leadership position. Uh, we launched Bud Zero this year, of course, a, a big innovation launch for us. The non-alk beer category in the United States is growing double digits, uh, very strong growth area. Other players, of course, coming uh, into the scene, other, other BI member companies as well. So the opportunity to educate consumers on new occasions, how non-alk beers can play a role in those occasions, um, it's a tremendous opportunity. Of course, non alcoholic beers can be used as alternating, you know, between buds. We talk about hydrating between buds, but a bud zero between buds. Um, you know, fourth quarter of football games, eighth night inning of baseball games, third period of hockey games. Those are occasions we feel uh, are ripe for opportunity to um, promote, share, and distribute our non alcoholic products, which is now led by Bud Zero. Yes, uh, as you say, um, uh, so many different non alcoholic products coming, just coming. Uh, into the market in the United States. It is an innovation, which is very important in beer, but we've also seen uh, the results of a greater distribution of non-alcoholic beer in other parts of the world, particularly in Europe, where it's a 10, 15, 20 share of the beer market. Um, and as you say, double digits growth now, and who knows where that will be in the future. You you all at Anheuser-Busch have a goal in terms of um, uh, your non-alcoholic products as part of your portfolio. What, we what do. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks for asking. So our goal, Jim, is that 20% of our beer volume by the end of 2025 will either be non-alk products or low-alk beer products. So we would define low-alk as 3.5% ABV and below. Uh, the majority are non-alk, but we have a number of, of low-alk products uh, in our portfolio across the globe, too. So that is our goal, uh, led by our, our CEO, Carlos Brito. So um, we all need to work together to, to achieve that. That's our goal in the next five years to hit that number. Sort of another point of differentiation too for beer be, uh, be uh, sort of against spirits or wine. Um, we have the ability in, in the brewing process to, to make a, a beer that tastes more like beer at 0% alcohol. Um, talk about just very briefly, just talk about the difference between a Bud Zero and some of the other products that uh, folks may have seen in the marketplace uh, over, the, over the years. That, those, those other products, they have a little bit of alcohol, Whereas the Bud Zero or you know your competitors, your zero competitors have zero alcohol. Yeah, so um, for many years, a product we launched 30 years ago, uh, Oduls, came out in 1990. Um, that product is 0.5% uh, alcohol, so a, a very small amount of alcohol. Budweiser Zero was a very big innovation for us. Our first 0, 0.0 uh, alcohol uh, beer. Um, of course, it took a lot of very talented women and men uh, to come together. Uh, to get the taste like a Budweiser, it's only 50 calories, zero grams of sugar, deliver a product that really meets our standards, our taste profile to carry the Budweiser name, um, while being also 0, 0.0, it was really for us a, a tremendous uh, innovation accomplishment. So uh, responsible consumption, second pillar. Third pillar, environmental sustainability. This is something that obviously uh, many companies, uh, global national companies have uh, been uh, talking about for a number of years now. And, and it only really gets bigger as a, uh, uh, as a piece of making the world better for you guys or for any other consumer product. I, um, I, uh, I want to begin this segment with a 2019 Super Bowl ad. Hey, we've run those before. Uh, to sort of synopsize what environmental sustainability means to Anheuser-Busch. So let's watch.
again, uh, brilliant creativity to, to, to bring a, an issue uh, not selling something to light. So why don't you tell us about that ad and, and tell us what, uh, what it's meant to convey. Yes, uh, absolutely. So uh, as you said, another piece of creative we were tremendously proud of uh, ran in the February 2019 Super Bowl. Um, that, of course, uh, showcased our commitment to, to wind electricity to power our breweries. So that's actually a wind farm that we have in central Oklahoma. The Budweiser Wind Farm uh, is what that was showcasing. And the electricity produced at that wind farm uh, provided us enough electricity to power all of the electricity needs to, to brew and package Budweiser at our breweries across the country. So we, Budweiser is powered by renewable electricity. It has been for a number of years now. Uh, we have a goal. We have a 2025 sustainability goal here in the United States that will achieve 100% of all of our electricity needs delivered by renewable electricity by 2025. We got halfway there. Um, with the advent and uh, uh, launch of operations of our wind farm in central Oklahoma. So uh, um, as we see the graphic here, 2025 U.S. sustainability goals, certainly more than uh, renewable energy. Why don't you talk about some of the other goals that you have? Sure. Uh, smart ag is a very critical goal to us. Of course, we can't brew and make any of our products like any other brewer uh, without farmers and growers across the country. So ensuring they have the resources, the technology, the training they need to be as efficient um, with their part of the process, you know, growing hops, uh, growing the barley, everything we need to grow our products is critical. Um, water efficiency is, is, you know, how can we be as, as efficient as possible in all of our breweries? We've taken learnings across the globe. It's a huge advantage of being part of a global company to ensure being as efficient as possible with our water usage at all of our facilities. Uh, and then our packaging as well. We want to ensure that we have the appropriate level of uh, recycled content in all of our packaging too. So as we push towards a higher level of recycled content in our packaging, and of course our carbon footprint, reducing our carbon footprint as well. Uh, like any our other large CPG company, uh, we're very committed to. We track against these goals. We release progress uh, moving forward, um, and we're tying this to 2025. And you know we don't uh, accept not achieving any of our goals. So we have a, a group of very talented people cross-functionally working to ensure we hit all of our goals uh, by 2025, if not before. But you know, uh, so uh, companies like Anheuser Busch are, are um, uh, so good at uh, creating these metrics uh, to meet in the future. But obviously, you have so many other partners that uh, you need to sort of buy into the system. Uh, uh, you know, uh, folks probably don't think when they enjoy a, a Budweiser or a Budweiser Zero. Uh, how big the ag community is that uh, that backs up that beer. Um, how do you work with your growers and distributors and can and glass suppliers to sort of buy them into your vision of the future um, when you're making these goals? Yes, uh, you know, we, for our external partners, our growers, our vendors, um, et cetera, well, we have a platform we call Eclipse. Uh, where we showcase what we're doing in terms of working to achieve our 2025 sustainability goals, the role that they need to play for us to achieve those goals. We can't do it alone. These are goals that require many, many stakeholder groups, sharing of best practices. It's really about working together, educating each other, challenging each other. You know, what can we do? Um, you know, we don't make all of our, our primary and secondary packaging. As you said, our farmers and growers give us the raw materials we need to brew our products. How can we all work together to ensure we're being as efficient and sustainable as possible uh, and drive further? And how do we work together to learn from this round of sustainability goals to set us up for our next round of sustainability goals after 2025? Yeah, that's that's super important. You 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 can make so much progress over a number of years that gets you to the next set of goals 10 years later, 15 years later, 20 years later. That's how you make uh, this progress uh, so well, it, it seems. Obviously, not just uh, not just one um, uh, in one aspect of sustainability, but really across the board. Yes, uh, when you figure the water we use, the packaging we use, all of our stakeholders, from our growers to our consumers, how do we educate? How do we challenge? How do we learn so we can do more? Uh, most importantly, for more impact. The the goal is very simple: uh, to significantly reduce our our environmental footprint. Um, so I have to put my glasses on. Uh, I, this is the point in the conversation where I urge our viewers to uh, send in some questions, but I can't see them, unfortunately, as I get older here. Uh, so let me just uh, lean over and take a look here. Right. Uh, we have a question from Amanda. Uh, 
uh, for Adam. How can consumers work with Anheuser-Busch to help promote your sustainability goals? That's a great question. Um, so uh, first and foremost, um, you know, our products that are brewed with renewable electricity, it leads with Budweiser. Uh, by 2025, our whole portfolio will be brewed with renewable electricity. Uh, of course, uh, sharing that means something to you. Sharing on social media why you made a purchase decision, uh, that's very critical for us to understand and help kind of promote what we're doing. Um, and it being as uh, sustainable and efficient in your personal life as well, of course, we're all in this together. So we have a, a marketing question here, or sorry, a sort of more consumer or commercial question here from Emily. Um, and I think Emily's been on other calls, so thank you for uh, joining us again, Emily. Um, how has Anheuser-Busch embraced the seltzer market? So uh, an innovation in beer, obviously, a, a very important innovation in beer, and you guys are all in on seltzer. How, how, do, you think about, uh, how do you think about seltzer? Well, uh, I'll give a basic answer, to be yeah. honest. I'm probably not the best person at how right. to answer this. But of course, uh, seltzer is a key part of our portfolio, uh, diversifying our seltzer portfolio. Of course, we're very proud of Bud Light Seltzer and all the other products that we have. More innovations to come. Obviously, it's driving the beer industry dramatically this year. Uh, the numbers prove that out and um, can help us drive our industry to further, uh, further growth next year. You know, when you talk about, uh, obviously, the commercial was about wind uh, power and wind energy. You want to be 100% uh, uh, using 100% renewable energy in your breweries by 2025. How much energy is that, Adam? Well, we don't give the specifics in terms of the, I guess, the, the raw numbers, Jim. But I, what I can say is, so we're, we're essentially 50% there with the wind farm we have operational in Oklahoma. We are currently constructing a solar farm uh, in West Texas, Picos County, Texas, that's going to get us that 100% mark. Um, so we're excited for uh, the year ahead to get that solar farm operational. So we're producing enough renewable electricity to power all of our operations. So that's a huge project that's ongoing right now. And we look forward to talking a lot more about that uh, next year. Wind farms, solar farms, your core mission is to make and uh, distribute beer, well, to make beer uh, at Anheuser-Busch. Um, uh, talk about the sort of external environment around the, the, the desire to get involved in these different kinds of sustainability goals. Yeah. Well, first of all, it's, Sustainability is our business, right? So uh, Brito, Michelle, our leadership back this up uh, every time they speak internally and externally. So uh, again, without raw materials, uh, without water, without everything we need to run our business, uh, of course we wouldn't exist. So sustainability has to be at the core of our business. It's not a nice to have, it's a must have. Um, and of course, more and more consumers want to ensure that corporations and individual brands have a purpose associated with it. So we wanna be very clear uh, where our purpose lies in the three pillars of the platform I get to lead in terms of better world, sustainability, responsible consumption, community impact, tied to the purpose of our company, and then our brands build off that and communicate in, in really amazing ways. John asks a question, which I uh, think you will be able to answer. Uh, what are you guys doing to convert to organics? Well, it's a, it's a process, it's an ongoing process. So uh, really led by um, Michelob Ultra Pure Gold, right? The first um, USDA certified organic beer in the marketplace a few years ago. And now we're rolling that out um, to other brands within our portfolio. You know, what I can tell you is it's an extremely rigorous process to be certified organic. It's not something that you go into lightly. Uh, we've learned quite a bit with Pure Gold, a brand we're incredibly proud of tied to the Ultra family. Um, so more and more products that will come from us moving forward will have that organic certification. Uh, we know it's critical to many, many consumers. Uh, we look forward to bringing those to the marketplace. You have so many brands at Anheuser-Busch that really uh, talk to the consumer. You talked about Michelob Ultra Gold. You talked about Budweiser Zero and how you how Budweiser is, how you use the Bud brand. Um, uh, talk a little bit about the importance of uh, brands in your work. Brands are how we connect with consumers, Jim, right? So uh, many stakeholders, I, and hopefully uh, all the stakeholders on, on this webinar know Anheuser-Busch, but we communicate through our brands, right? So um, through our very large brands, Bud Light, Michelob Ultra, Budweiser, Bush, through our craft partners, now through our seltzer brands, so the seltzer question earlier, it's how we connect with consumers and you can connect in a very different way, particularly through the own channels the social media channels those brands have. So when they tie their messaging, their activation to purpose, 
and the purpose of our overall company, we can build bridges between a brand like Bud Light Seltzer and what Anheuser-Busch stands for, or a brand like Goose Island, or Anheuser-Busch stands for. It's a tremendous opportunity to work with uh, our sales and marketing teams, um, our teams on the ground, of course, across the country, understand what's going on uh, in each state, in each city, again, to connect. So without those connection points, um, we will not be able to, to drive the industry forward, which we aim to do. And Adam, innovation doesn't really just happen in the brands or in the liquid that's inside the bottle. It really also happens with the packaging. We've seen that in beer over the last over the last number of years. So talk about some of the innovations that uh, uh, you're seeing in aluminum cans in particular. Yeah, very proud, Jim. We just uh, announced a partnership with Rio Tinto. Um, they have formed a JV with Alcoa called Elisys. Elisys is a lower carbon aluminum. So the production of the aluminum, it can be 30% lower carbon emissions. So we're going to have the first trial of the Elisys technology through our Make Level Ultra brand. We just announced there'll be 1 million cans that should hit the market in early 2021. So we're still finalizing exactly where we'll, we'll launch that pilot. We just announced this a few weeks ago. So having a lower carbon can, uh, innovating the packaging in that front, consumers, it'll feel, it'll look the same. It just is uh, produced using lower carbon itself, that aluminum can. You know, you talked about the importance of brands in the work that you do. Uh, Susan asks the question, um, how do you tie in Anheuser-Busch's history uh, um, with how you're moving forward in better world? Yeah, I love that question. And it's amazing the equity that Anheuser-Busch has created over many, many decades. So talk about responsible drinking. I, you know, I mentioned some of the Budweiser advertising uh, over, from over 100 years ago. But since 1982, year in and year out, the company, whether through the Anheuser-Busch brand and logo or the Budweiser brand, has invested in campaigns, designate a driver, know when to say when, give a damn, drink wiser. Um, it's out there and we're investing year over year. So we can kind of go back on that shared equity. Uh, one example of something we did this year for Better World is we brought back uh, know when to say when. We created a new piece of created. Uh, we tied it to the men and women working in bars and restaurants across the country. Of course, critical to sell our products. Um, it will well showcase how we want our products to be sold responsibly, while also showcasing the health and safety protocols necessary uh, during COVID-19. So we launched that this summer, a, a revival of no one to say when. And without the original equity from the 1980s, we couldn't do that. Right. And, you know, as you say, uh, we, you, you have been talking about responsibilities since before the 80s, obviously. So you're bringing back these campaigns that really resonate with consumers. And that's really been something that's very important to beer overall. I mean, you you all, all are the largest brewer in the United States and globally. Um, but, um, but beer has uh, been a leader as an industry in the alcohol sector when it comes to responsible consumption. So I, I think that's really important. I think the work you're doing is is super important and you're just really building on it aren't you we're building it we're trying to drive it to a next level we have um the amazing opportunity from the successes of the past to drive it forward and then to your point when you think about beer versus other segments of the alcohol industry uh no one does more in this space in the beer industry tremendously proud to be a part of it and, and as a wish we're we're proud to, to try to drive that forward and, and demonstrate leadership and we are proud that you're doing it we are uh, down to one minute so um I wanted to thank you, Adam, for uh, all your time uh, today and all your insights on what you're doing in the better world. Uh, just I mean, give you an opportunity to sort of sum it up. You guys are doing lots of great stuff. You personally are doing lots of great stuff. Um, uh, any any final words for our viewers out there? Yeah, you know, just quickly, I, I'm, I'm lucky to be part of a tremendous team in terms of our better world team, tremendously talented colleagues, part of a, an amazing company to work for. Of course, I'm biased now as a long-term employee of Anheuser Bush, but um, we practice what we preach and we drive ourselves forward each and every day. And then, in terms of being part of the big industry, it's an honor. Uh, I can't imagine leaving. I love being a part of the industry and the opportunities it's afforded me and my family. Um, now, the challenge is: what more can we do? How can we drive our industry forward, our category forward, uh, while driving change and progress? It's beer, uh, and you are doing good um, as you make great products. So uh, Adam Warrington, Vice President of Better World at Anheuser-Busch, thank you so much for being a part of our uh, webinar series, and thank you all to our viewers for uh, participating again in this discussion. Uh, we'll be back to you for our fifth and final webinar uh, here in just a couple weeks um, when we talk to the good folks at Molson Coors. So Adam, 
once again, thank you so much. Thank you all to the viewers, and we'll see you next time. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers.